Welcome to History at the OK Corral. History too real for the Westerns. Don't forget to click like, share, subscribe, ring that notification bell, and leave us a comment if you like this story. October 13th, 1837. Fort Smith, Texas, north of present-day Waco. In the crisp autumn air, the acrid aroma of burnt coffee beans hung like a morning fog, mixing with the pungent, ever-present smell of livestock, manure, and campfire smoke. As the regulars of the fort began their day's work of chores and guard duty, a group of a few dozen grizzled, buckskin-clad men saddled their horses, checked their single-shot rifles and pistols, and made ready to venture outside the relative safety of the fort walls. Leading this contingent of men was Lieutenant A.B. Van Van Thusen and Captain William Eastland. Before heading out, they conferred over the planned course of their incursion into what, at the time, was likely the most dangerous territory on the North American continent. Both men were relative newcomers to their positions in leadership, and though both felt they had been sufficiently respected in their tenures thus far, their positions as commissioned officers granted them little to none of the deference and obedience that would be expected within the ranks of the conventional military. That was because this was not the conventional military. These were the Texas Rangers. They themselves were a newly founded hybrid force of military and law enforcement that had been stood up by the burgeoning Republic of Texas after its cessation from Mexico though a number of tribes were or would eventually be on cooperative terms with the Spanish, French, Mexicans, and now Texians, tribes like the Waco, the Karankawa, the Apache, and the Caddo would routinely raid homesteads up and down the river valleys and flatland prairies of central and southern Texas. But of the sites any settler on the Texas frontier could see, perhaps the most terrifying was that of the Comanche. The Comanche were relatively recent arrivals to Texas themselves, having made their way down from the Rockies of Wyoming as part of a perpetually impoverished Shoshone offshoot. However, with the advent of horses from the Spanish making their way north, the trajectory of Comanche history had been forever altered. The Comanche were soon known as the most innately gifted horsemen of any tribe in North America. Their newly found attributes of speed and mobility made the Comanche not just a formidable force to any who drew their ire, but a killing and raiding machine the likes of which had rarely, if ever, been seen on the entirety of the continent before. The raids that were being conducted and would be conducted for decades to come were so all-encompassing in their violence and ferocity that they would effectively stall any sizable settlement attempts west of Dallas Austin, and San Antonio until well into the 19th century. On this day in 1837, the rangers made their way out of the gates of Fort Smith and headed out into the wilds of the Texas Hill Country in search of a raiding party of Comanche who had stolen a large number of horses from settlements on the Colorado River. The Comanche had headed north towards the open prairies and the rangers hoped to catch them before they absconded into the vast, empty expanses of the Great Plains. Over the succeeding weeks, the ranger force made their way up the Colorado River, trailing the Comanche party. On November 1st, the two officers, Van Bentuzen and Eastland, split their forces in order to follow different trails. This reduced Van Bentuzen's force to 18 men. They continued north until reaching the Brazos, where they got into a brief skirmish with a party of Cherokee and Kichi, whom they had mistaken for Comanches. One Kichi was actually killed before the Cherokee were able to make discernible peace signs towards the Texians. This caused no small amount of embarrassment and conciliatory efforts on behalf of the Rangers. The Cherokee and Kichi were also avowed enemies of the Comanche, having lost far more of their wives, children, and warriors to Comanche raiding than even the most remote and harrowed frontier settlers in Texas. Once amends had been made, the Cherokee and Kichi was still gracious enough, and pragmatic enough, to point the rangers in the direction of the fleeing Comanche party. Despite the loss of one of their own party, their hatred for Comanche raiders would outweigh their disdain for Texian intruders 
on this particular occasion. It would be another full week of tracking, though, until November 10th, at a location Lieutenant Van Bentusen marked at latitude 33 and a half north on the Trinity River, that rangers would finally make contact with their intended target. The two parties spotted each other almost simultaneously, as the Comanche were unaccustomed to being followed so far into their own territory that they had ceased posting the sentries that would have been de rigueur were they closer to the Texian settlements. The Comanche immediately split their forces, with some of the younger warriors driving the horse herd off to the north and the more experienced warriors heading off to attack Van Bentusen's rangers, utilizing tactics that would soon be considered nearly suicidal with the advent of more combat experience against Comanche forces. The rangers dismounted and prepared to receive the Comanche charge from behind a mound that rose up from the surrounding prairies and woodlands. Lieutenant Van Bentusen stood on top of the mound to survey the oncoming force and estimated it to be roughly 150 mounted Comanche warriors, riders whose skill might be best exemplified for the modern day listener in a rodeo trick rider, all capable of unleashing 10 or more arrows a minute and all coming at them at full speed. This meant that the Texian force of 18 men was outnumbered roughly eight to one. These were not terribly favorable odds and Van Ventusen and his men were all too aware of this. The rangers moved back from the ridge, deciding instead to receive the Comanche charge from the cover of a small thicket of trees at the base of a ridge. Almost immediately after making it to the timber line, the Comanche were upon them, raining arrows down upon the ranger position and, as Van Ventusen describes, uttering the most savage yells. The rangers, armed with single-shot rifles and pistols, could not match the volume of fire nor maneuverability that the Comanche were now so deftly wielding against them. For over two hours, the fight raged on with intermittent attacks nearly overrunning the Texians several times. Though these men had not been long in Texas, they all understood that being overrun by the Comanches would mean for each and every one of them a terrible death. The rules of plains warfare, especially in Texas, made no concessions for prisoners when it came to military-aged males. Should they be overrun here, any who were not killed outright would be slowly, sadistically, tortured to death underneath the looming Texas sky. Even in 1837, every hamlet, homestead, and burgeoning city had been inundated with the tales of Comanche victims being burned skinned, eviscerated, and emasculated, in the literal sense, all while still alive and begging for mercy. But, as was now apparent to every man hunkered down amongst the trees that day, there was no mercy to be found in Texas. Van Bentusen describes the fighting as mostly taking place within 15 to 20 feet of each other, with bullets and arrows flying the exhortations of commanders and the screams of the wounded filling the air. Four rangers and six horses were killed in the initial fighting, as the Comanche exacted a heavy toll on the small force. The lieutenant described the Comanche as being led on by a chief who was most splendidly mounted. Again and again throughout the afternoon hours, the rangers had tried and failed to bring this chief down. Finally, a Texian bullet managed to find its target, and the chief tumbled from his mount, dead. In Comanche warfare, this was not just a tactical loss, but a spiritual condemnation as well. They believed the chief's medicine, or puha, had been somehow compromised, indicative that the metaphysical powers that they relied upon were no longer working in their favor. The Comanche warriors retreated over a ridge and out of sight, leaving the rangers under the impression that the battle was over. But it was not. After about 15 minutes, another Comanche charred barreled over the ridge at full speed. The rangers, who had been tending to their wounded and making ready to retreat, again took up defensive positions within the cluster of trees. A new chief was leading the Comanches this time, and the attack, as before, came head on at the rangers as they hunkered down and did their best to return fire. Then, one of the Texans noticed an even thicker layer of smoke than was typical of a battle like this, 
rapidly ensconcing their force. Looking around, the source of the smoke was discovered. The Comanche had lit a giant ring of fire around the wooded area, intent on either smoking out the rangers or watching them burn alive. Left with these two options, Van Ventusen ordered his men into a headlong attack on foot. The rangers charged out of the tree line, kneeling to fire and then reloading on the move as arrows flew all around them and the fire raged larger and loomed even closer. This charge, all but suicidal in its execution, lasted roughly 10 minutes and left six more rangers dead. This offensive attack did, however, drive the Comanche, whose tactical repertoire did not include receiving attacks at any great cost to themselves, into a retreat. This left a brief but sufficient gap in time in which the rangers managed to collect their wounded and make their escape, on foot, to the Sabine River. A full 58 days after they had ridden out of Fort Smith, Lieutenant Van Bentusen's ranger force, now just eight men strong, straggled their way back into Fort Smith. They had been lucky to survive, and they all knew it. It would be several years, and many lives lost later, until the rangers would learn how to fight effectively against mounted Comanches in open territory. Until then, fights like this would happen countless times, with many leaving no survivors to tell the tale. But for tonight, those are other stories for other times. But what did you think? Were the rangers brave or foolhardy? Were the Comanche noble defenders of their lands, or was their level of violence unnecessary? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, History Too Real for the Westerns.